This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week, we are joined by Yotam Haber and Todd Tarantino. Yotam is the outgoing artistic director of the MADA Festival, uh, and Todd is the executive director of the the MADA Festival. Uh, Yotam was on the show last year, I guess, to talk about the 15th annual uh, festival, and this year they're about to start the 16th, and it starts in about a week as we're recording this. It's really exciting. They've got some really great events. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure. It's good Thanks to be for here. Us. And uh, Yotam, uh, perhaps we can start with you. For, for anybody in our audience that is not familiar with uh, the Mata Festival, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what it, what it is? Uh, the Mata Festival stands for uh, Music at the Anthology. It's been around for 16 years, founded by Philip Glass, uh, Lisa Bielava, and Eleanor Sandresky in 1996 um, as a very small and uh, grassroots festival in the East Village. Now it's become pretty much, I think, it's uh, officially the most applied for composition opportunity in the world we received somewhere around a thousand applications this year and uh we're very proud to make this year's festival um one of i think the biggest festival we've had uh in mata's history um every year we try to bring in ensembles uh from outside of the united states we we of course every year bring composers from around the world uh it is it is absolutely the most competitive uh, op- composition opportunity that I know of. And the composers that make it into the festival, uh, we're very proud to say uh, we, we, we believe strongly that they are some of the most interesting young voices around. Well, and it's 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 really cool because you're you're drawing from that that such a wide pool. You can be very selective, obviously, but you are, I think, looking at this year's slate and and last year's that we talked about last time, getting a really diverse group of presentations together. And I think that's uh, one thing that I associate with this festival in particular is that it really. I think gives a great broad look at the sorts of music that people that, that young composers around the world are making in a way that a lot of festivals, uh, which and, and there's something to be said for a narrowly focused festival as well, but this is such a great look at what's going on in the world. Um, we we're, we're proud to say that we're dogmatically undogmatic. <laughs> we we really try to find. Uh, the most interesting voices across. Uh, we just don't talk about any aesthetic bent at Mata. We just choose the most interesting music. So uh, when you get that many applicants, and, and I know we talked a lot about the application process when you were on the show before, wh- how, do you, how do you decide what those, what those things are that are, that are um, you know, dogmatically undogmatic, which is a great, great expression? Um, how do you apply your lack of dogma to a thousand applicants? I can take that question. Yeah, go for it, Todd. Um, well, this year we actually just went through the process for next year's festival, when, and we had 979 applicants, which was wow. crazy. So what we do is we assemble sort of a broad jury. We find people who we think have um, open minds, who are open to all different aesthetics. We randomly split up the pool among them. I had eight this year. And then we pass it through one juror. They choose seven. Then we send the rest to another juror. They choose seven. And by the end, we have about 120 that we work from. Then we have a two-day listening session that is grueling but interesting. And uh, we're left with about the top 50. And then the artistic director goes to town. That's a lot of, that's a lot of really hard listening. It yeah. Is- it really is. I, I can't imagine. I, I just uh, a couple of weeks ago went to the uh, the North American Saxophone Alliance conference, and that there's just so much 
really hardcore listening that you do for a four day span by the end of it you're totally wiped Is, you have that experience with this absolutely absolutely totally exhausted at the end of the day but it's, it's a good exhausted oh but it's great it's great yeah. it's so exciting to see all the wonderful things that people are doing yeah and and so then then you, after you've you've called it to that list of 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 a few people then you said that you turn it over to the artistic director uh yotam uh what what is that what is that next step for you uh that that is the 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 difficult uh part of narrowing down that list yeah um to to, to a festival so um we're lucky to have a, a really gigantic festival this this year where we are able to host 34 composers. It's usually wow. not that many different voices on the festival. And, uh, um, you know, it's the balancing act of trying not only to select the most interesting composers, but also figuring out uh, the the... Uh, ensembles that can perform these works as well. Right. So it's it's always um, really a, a a tricky tricky business of of figuring out what the actual festival is going to be. And I think I've said this last year, but I really want to encourage those composers who didn't make it to the Monte Festival uh, to keep applying because. Oftentimes, it's not just about uh, whether you were um, uh, not good enough, but simply that the, the that balancing act didn't quite work out with with trying to fit a composer with the ensembles that we have. Since we're oftentimes dealing with the schedules of very in-demand groups. Uh, we are scheduling things two years in advance, if not more than that. So oftentimes we have the ensemble in place before we have the composers on the festival. Right. And, so and, the, and Go ahead. So, you know, we, we, I really do encourage, and oftentimes I will write individual notes to composers and, and remind them that. And, you know, I, I really hate the standard form rejection letter. And I... Uh, when I when I write and say I encourage you to apply again, uh, we mean that. Yeah, well, and it's important to remember that this is not a, a competition per se. This is you're curating a festival, right? You're you're putting together this this whole holistic artistic experience for people, and that's not the same as just you know picking a, a, a few winners and a few runners up, um, and and and. Uh, you know, you you actually have a number of events, and one of the things I think is pretty cool about uh, the Mata Festival is looking at your events. There are a bunch of really interesting performances, and then there are a bunch of really interesting uh, kind of workshop sessions as well. And and one of them uh, that that I'm looking at here on the site <coughs> is is called "On the Art of Curation." And um, mm -hmm. so that seems to me to be about exactly what, what you're talking about here is that there, there is a, an artistic vision that you have to put together. And sometimes that is not always going to represent uh, exactly the, 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 the 20 great things that you got, but it's the 20 things that are, are great and fit this, this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Todd, take this one. Um, yeah, and the jury changes each year also. So so one year you may have bad luck with the jury, the next year you'll have good luck. We've seen, at least in the two years I've been through it, I've seen some of the same names come through and get to different places than they were before. You know, composers mature, jury changes. Uh, and on top of that, there is the act of curation. We, you know, what Yotam's not mentioning is that the artistic director also takes basically a month to look at the entire catalog of the top 50 composers and find what we think are the best pieces of their catalog that fit within sort of, you know, purely um, pragmatic things. You know, we can't, if we don't have a chorus, we can't do a choral piece. You know, so 
all these things come together. But there is, we do pay a lot of attention to our composers, and we and we really look for the best that they can do as well. And and so you are you are having a call for composers, and then going out and finding ensembles, correct? In general, yeah. Uh, how do you how do you determine which ensembles that you that you seek out? Is that just based on the submissions that you get from the composers, or do you have some uh, some players in mind that that you like to work with? Well, we we um, you know it, it's really a little bit of both. We some as I said, sometimes we have ensembles in place before the festival just because of scheduling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we receive a work uh, that is so special and out of the ordinary that we need to find an ensemble, a special ensemble to perform that work. But in general, we're looking for uh, ensembles that have a special kind of virtuosity, the virtuosity that they can easily cross many boundaries stylistically, um, technically, and are open to new ideas that, you know, there are some wonderful ensembles everywhere, uh, not just in New York, that do one thing and do it very, very well. And sometimes that's the right ensemble. But more often than not, I think that we are looking for ensembles that can uh, uh, are not afraid of approaching a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, um, so as Todd was saying, uh, once we decide we want composer X to be in, in the Mata Festival, we really take the time to look at everything that that composer has written to see what we can fit on that festival. Uh, and in, in that sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a call for composers rather than a call for scores. Right. And that's very exciting. That's, 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 that's very a, a cool way to describe it. And I would imagine that there's a fair amount of um, almost matchmaking involved, right? That you're you're trying to put people together that are going to work together through the course of the festival to to make something that that they couldn't have made separately. Um, and uh, I, I I wonder if you can if you if either of you could comment on on that process of of matching a composer with an ensemble. I, I could say something about what's happening in this year's festival. Um, this year, one of our commissions was Hikari Kiyama. He's a Japanese composer. He sort of has been moving around Europe a lot. Um, and we had decided sort of independently to bring in Usinta Ensemble, which is a Finnish new music ensemble, young Finnish new music ensemble. Well, it turns out that Hikari Kiyama has just moved to Helsinki. And ah. so this was a wonderful opportunity for him to sort of get together with them and really work. It was fortuitous. But I think this is something that we want to think about more in the future also, is is at, at one point matchmaking at the same time bringing composers to ensembles who they would never meet. Right. Because that's, that's the exciting thing. You know, if you're already friends with an ensemble, you don't need Matza to put us together. Right. But if you're not, if you're, you know, from, if you're a composer in, in Italy and we have an ensemble in America that doesn't know you, well, there's a great opportunity for a match. And we hope, though I, we can't guarantee it, obviously, that, that they will take that piece and give it a life beyond our festival. Well, and I, I would imagine that a lot of times they do start a relationship that continues beyond the festival, correct? I doubt it. Um, have, you seen, have you seen anything in, in particular that, that you could you comment on? Some, some particular collaboration that has continued to, to create something great after the festival? Your time? I, I, I think we see it every single year after Mata Festival ends. We see new connections happening uh, with international composers and American ensembles, with American ensembles and international composers. Um, you know, once you are uh, in the Mata Festival, we, it sounds a little hokey, but you're really part of the Mata family. And mm -hmm. that means that uh, you're not simply forgotten. It, it, it's almost like the uh, you've graduated from the Mata Academy. Mm -hmm. And you have a certain cachet um, that carries, that really carries with performers, with with uh, presenters. So we we feel like it's almost like a professional training ground um, to be in the festival. 
and that during the festival week, it's crucial for, for composers and ensembles to spend time together, to get to know each other, to uh, form new friendships, new connections. And I, I think it's been very fruitful. That's it's, it's and, and if I may add to your your slightly uh, hokey verbiage, I, I think there's something kind of magical about actually being in the same space as as the other people, right? That 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 sort of of connection and the sorts of projects that you kind of cook up um, in the in the little in between working times in that kind of situation are are not easy to generate without actually just being thrown together in that kind of situation. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a very cool thing that you do. And, and, you know, once you've been in the Mata Festival, it does not preclude you from being in future Mata Festivals and uh, all many other uh, events that we have. We, we have uh, salons that are for um, donors. We have um, interval concerts, which are another class of, of Mata concerts that happen throughout the year. And we always have composers who are, uh, of course, our mission is to serve young composers, but we have composers who already have an international career. And we have composers who for whom the Mata Festival is really the launching pad for a career. So sometimes we're dealing with both ensembles and performers who are yet untested. And so if, if they succeed, and of course they always do, that means that we, we, we will continue to think of them. And, they, and, and you, you will see certain composers coming back again and again, season after season, in different ways, in, in different configurations. That's it's, it, go ahead. It's interesting that uh, you mentioned the Mata Festival, the, the graduating from the Mata Academy and everything. Um, it, some of these workshops seem like you could really uh, build some skills as well. Having representatives from ASCAP and BMI leading sessions on uh, putting together resources or things you might need to know as a composer. Those seem like really good resources, and I imagine people attending the festivals at, uh, would really get something out of that as well. Yeah, this, this year we decided to take our business of being a composer work, workshop panel and sort of split it into two. Mm -hmm. One is sort of going to be focused on doing things yourself. So we have a lot of people who have put together their own things, Sarah Snyder from, with New Amsterdam Records, yeah. you know, um, Rick Carrick with the Either Or Ensemble. Um, and then the other one is sort of being working within institutions. So once you've put something together for yourself, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. So we've got Katie Barron who's going to talk about contracts, you know, and uh, future Chadwick on licensing. You know, and so these are sort of the two different aspects. What we are hoping to do in the future is sort of break this out into a year-long sort of monthly event where we focus hands-on on each individual thing. So... Here we go. Everyone bring your biography. Boy, your biography needs work. What if we do X, <laughs> Y, and Z to it? If this isn't your CV. This is a biography. You know, ah. and sort of this is where we want to move forward next year. That's this some really valuable stuff. I would, that's, I mean, I, I'm not in New York, but I would totally go to that workshop. Well, we would, because my biography needs them. some help. <laughs> <laughs> are you guys uh, speak, resources, you know yeah well, sp speaking of which are you guys um re recording any of these sessions because i would I, I was just reading through some of these and i was thinking i would love to uh, like have that video as a as a reference of we are, um streaming all the festival concerts through q2 which is wqxr's online um arm i guess we call it um we're in discussions about about recording and streaming the two business of being a composer events. Um, there may be some technical problems that we're trying to work out on that, but we're hoping to do it. If nothing else, we're hoping to record them for our own purposes and then uh, eventually host them. Yeah. You know, even on a YouTube or somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, w I would be more than happy to experience advertising in return for getting to watch those. <laughs> at some point in the future. Well, let's well, see. It's all, it all boils down to advertising in one way or another. Yeah, right. Yeah. He's got to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and I can only imagine the, the ad benefit of ex 
experiencing this in person and getting to be part of that conversation in these workshops. You, you get to be our curating panel. When do you get to be in a room with four new music curators? Right. Yeah. I mean, any composer who doesn't sign up for this, I don't know what they're thinking. Right. <laughs> so you should all watching this be embarrassed that you've not that you're not doing this if you're not doing this i i I agree that i mean that that curation thing sounds fascinating i i i do so this is going to include some well it's going to include yotam obviously as 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 his he's got a lot of experience uh, curating this particular festival um but uh you've got some some other people that have a lot of experience doing this and yes. and thinking about you know putting together a program that is beneficial to the people that are that are presenting the program and that is compelling to the audience and getting people in the door and it's just so much that that goes into it that is both uh, curating a, a series like this I I think is a really interesting nexus of. Uh, an artistic vision and uh, a business proposition. Um, <laughs> perhaps you could comment on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know about the business. Well, aspect. I mean, business not in the for-profit sense, but like if yeah. if people aren't coming, then then there's not. I mean, there's not a lot of value to presenting a concert to to empty space. You know, I think that the 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 interesting thing about Mata is, if you want to call it a brand, is that. Uh, I think that we've arrived at a place where people come to Mata trusting us that we're going to present a festival of music that will excite them. And that's, and that's crucial in, 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 in a festival which is constantly presenting composers that you have never heard of, right? So we, it's, it's not that we're presenting... Uh, household names. We're presenting composers that we believe wholeheartedly are the next generation of composers that will be in the cultural conversation, that will make the cultural conversation. And those voices have not yet uh, become famous. Right. And, and so we're very proud to, to, to have found them. And uh, the, the way that you get uh, butts and seats is by year after year simply making exciting festivals. And, right, right. But, and that way you slowly uh, create a following that will uh, believe in, in your mission. Well, and then you kind of help people build out that network of trusted sources, right? I, I trust the the Mata Festival to present something great and when I go and I hear you know you mentioned Hikari Kiyama I've not heard any of his music before but I I would go because I trust Mata and then maybe I would <coughs> learn how much I dig this composer's music and then I would seek that out and then build a trust that this composer is going to make great stuff and then you kind of work from there and, and you find a performer that has performed his music and then you build this this trust with that performer and and it's a it's a it's a neat little um kind of uh goodwill economy of um of 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 trust that people make great things so uh and 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 mata is kind of a starting point because of that huge pool of applicants that you draw from um, that you can make such great things. And I think that's, in a lot of ways, the value of something like a Mata Festival is, is, like you said, to take from this pool of, of thousand, uh, a thousand applicants to, to pull out the stuff that we can really just dig into. And, and from there, um, the, the process that you described earlier of digging through their catalog to find what you think is great and what fits the festival, I think, is, is really interesting. Um, so thank you for, for doing all that work to, to present us with, with this, this really great art. Um, I want to talk about some of the stuff on the, on, the, on the program that you're particularly excited about. You mentioned this commission from uh, Hikari Kiyama, and I, and I saw it earlier because it, and it stuck out to me just because of the title Death Metal. Um, is Jorori Death Metal. 
Well, well so I don't know uh, Joruri, but some the word death metal thing. stuck out to me. Okay, yes. yeah. It's what? It's some Japanese folk thing. Hikari is very much influenced by death metal, by Brian Fernihu, and now uh, Japanese folk music. So this is some sort of strange conglomeration of the three. It's going to be amazing. It There's sounds Dutch great. Calls and uh, I don't know. I'm but sold. Yeah. Go to YouTube and check out Hikari Kiyama's music and you'll see. Mm. So the death and drum sonata really sticks out to me. Nice. <laughs> so and, and this is all streamed, so we will definitely be checking out the streams next week. Yeah. Um and, and is th this is just audio streaming or is there video as well? Just audio streaming. Okay. Well, either way, sounds like it's gonna be very exciting. Uh do you have any, any anybody else that you wanna particularly well, bring to everyone's attention? If I can jump in for a sec. The I'm very, very excited about Edward Hamill's commission. Um he has been commissioned uh, for the first time in Mata's history. This is a co-commission with Holland's Gaudi Amos Festival mm. and the Venice Biennale, which has a, has a music component. Uh, the, the Venice Biennale, of course, is, is very well known as one of the premier uh, visual art uh, festivals. But it also has every year, not every other year, it has a music component and uh, uh, and we're very, very proud to have Edward Hamill, an American composer, uh, be our first co-commission with these two major, major international festivals. That's very cool. So what, what do you know anything about the piece yet? I would imagine uh, you probably know a lot about the piece since it's a it's like, week for, away. for baritone and piero ensemble. Um, nice. It's... There's a lot of very quiet moments. I haven't heard it, but I've seen the score. Um, and it should be very interesting. The text is, is it's treated in a very sort of abstract way. Um, you know, Edward's a really solid composer. And uh, we'll be doing it here with Talia Ensemble and Michael Wyant, who's a baritone, singing. In Venice, it's going to be performed by... T by Maytar Ensemble, and I'm not sure who's singing it. And then in Holland, it's going to be performed by a third ensemble. So this is a really great opportunity for, for, for Edward to get yeah. three different groups playing his piece in three serious venues. That's, that's pretty exciting that, that you've got different groups playing in, in those places. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. Um, what, is the, what is the text? Maybe I missed it if you, if you, know, you said I have it. To, yeah, you don't I know. Have where it comes from okay the title the title though is uh approach prune destroy begin mm. i'm in <laughs> <laughs> sold so, yeah you got me we should, we should talk about carolyn chen's piece which is the third commission would you want you want to talk about that todd go ahead yeah, todd. Uh, carolyn is uh um she's uh an american-born taiwanese descent composer and um, she's written a piece for violin, piano, percussion, and gu chin, which is a Chinese zither of some sort that she's playing, uh, and video. And it's, it's all about sort of her sort of poetic concept is the idea of falling. So, so there's all sorts of, there's, there's a surprise. I won't spoil the surprise for everyone who comes, but, but there's definitely a surprise that comes at the end involving falling. Um, but it should be also a very interesting piece. Spoiler alert. Yeah, Spoiler exactly. Alert. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, that's, oh. The, the Guchin is, is a really interesting thing. What, so that's, that's going to be interesting. I can't imagine scoring for that. It's, it's such, a, such a subtle, quiet instrument. Um, I think it would be amplified. Say what? Uh, Probably amplified. Okay. Let's see. Cool. We're also very excited to have... Uh, other than Usinta from Finland, we're having we we're hosting the Neue Vokal Solistin uh, from Stuttgart. Uh, really, one of the greatest vocal ensembles of my generation, and uh, they are going to uh, have two concerts uh, on the nineteenth. They are going to uh, devote an entire night of the festival to one work by the young uh, Swiss-Italian composer Oscar Bianchi. 
he has an evening length uh, cantata called Matra um, for a, an incredibly bizarre and beautiful uh, collection of instruments. And th that ensemble with texts by Lucretius, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, um, and tantric texts. It's an unbelievable work. Um, and we, we really uh, did not hesitate at all to devote a, an entire evening of the festival to this work because we, we believe so strongly in it. Let's I'll add to what go ahead. Tom is saying on that, if, if I may. Um, the trio is, the solo trio is, has proved to be very challenging for us, but we're pulling it off. It's a sub contrabass saxophone, which is called a two backs. Right. There are only about 15 in the country. They're, I'm reading about it on Wikipedia right now. Yeah. <laughs> I did see that. Whoop. There's a contrabass recorder, you know, and, right. and then a bass flute. But that, that, that's just the easy one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's. That, I love it that bass food course, is like yeah. the regular one. <laughs> its yeah. title being Matra was very good for us because you take the R out and you have Mata, so that's even. Of course, even yeah. of course. Mantra percussion is also playing, so you take the N out of Mantra, you get Matra. You take the R, out, you get Mata. So, yeah. it's, it's well, well played. It's very I fortuitous. See. That's what yes. curation is all about. That's right. <laughs> curation is basically Scrabble, is what I've learned. <laughs> Um, Curation 101, know the alphabet. Right, right. Uh, that, that, so that piece sounds fascinating. I don't think I've ever heard... I've heard a lot of saxophones. I'm reasonably certain I've never heard a subcontra bass saxophone. The thing is the size of a coffin. I bet. Well, I'm, a, I'm a saxophone nerd, and I had never seen one of them. I, I, I had heard legends. It's like, it's like the Loch Ness Monster, basically. Um but uh, I, I will definitely be tuning in to that one on Q2. I hope that the compression will hold up uh, over on the internet. We'll, we'll, we'll still deliver those low frequencies. That's got to be so much air to, to fill up that, that horn. That work, I think, I believe that work is also available on iTunes if you want to purchase it. I'm going right. to right now. So, um, uh, we've talked a lot about um, this year's festival and what you're trying to do for just next year. I'm well, wondering if you have any uh, like big plans. Like, what do you want to do ten years out, or do, are you? Does the pressure of the position allow you to think that far in the future? Is that question addressed to me or to Todd? I guess. Yeah. To I guess mostly to Todd. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, ten years out, who can say? We want to keep flourishing. We want to keep thriving. We we want to create a new normal of a week-long festival. We want to develop more support uh, and advocacy things for our constituency. We want to develop uh, the Interval Series, which is the, the occasional series of concerts that happens throughout the year. Um, you know, it all depends on sort of where the funding plan goes. You know? Right. You know, that's the sad thing about music in America is that, that, that money plays such an important part in it. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it's interval, hard to find support for stuff like this. Um, yes. And you guys do a great job at it. And We'd love to go, you know, every week, every, every, every two weeks with a new event. But, uh, you know, right. these things sort of push against budget realities. Right. Sam, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say the Interval Series... Um, wanted to note that Friends of the Show Contemporaneous played a show on that in February. That was an so, incredible show. Yeah, we've, uh, we had... They're an exciting group. We had uh, yeah. David and... Um, uh, blanking on his name. David Bloom and... Dylan? Dylan. Dylan thank you. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan Mattingly uh, on the show. Yeah. And they've been seeming... They seem to be doing a lot of stuff these days. They're really uh, exciting. They're so, they're so young and so, like... The, Where do they uh, get the energy is I, what I want to know. I don't know. Yeah, the guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I need a nap. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't have kids. Is, is it news time? It might be. What do you got, yeah, Sam? We, um, San Diego. Everybody heard that the San Diego Opera Company is kaput, but it turns out that might not be the case. Um, if anybody wants to get into an in-depth analysis, they're more than welcome. My take is... It's like a, a soap opera. A lot of people had issues with 
Campbell, the artistic and executive director, is that correct, of the company. A lot of people had issues with his management style, and a lot of the donors are saying, well, don't call it quits yet. Let's try and figure out a way to keep you open. And But there's a lot more than that if you care to read it. it was, it's really crazy. And this is, I think, goes back to what we were just talking about with the difficulty of, of, of funding these kinds of projects. That as, as the funding gets bigger, then you get even more crazy problems than you had before. Um, so, uh, I mean, sometimes they can be good problems, but they, problems are problems, right? Um, so that's, that's a, a crazy thing. Uh, Minnesota Orchestra, which we've been talking about for two years now and probably will never stop talking about because they do cool stuff, but um, we've been talking about their uh, labor dispute and their back ish at the moment uh we talked about michael henson the president uh ceo agreeing to to leave the the organization i guess later not right away but then in response to that because there were board members that were kind of on his side they were all upset that he had been asked to resign or kind of forced out as they saw it um due to pressure from the musicians and and the audience and they thought that that sent a bad signal to future uh, CEO hires. There were eight board members that resigned, and now we are waiting to see what happens with Osmo Vanska. If he will be able to return as the music director, it would be great if he did. He made some great recordings and, and gave some great performances with them while he was there, including, as we mentioned last week, the most recent Grammy winner in orchestral music uh, for his his Sibelius most recent Sibelius cycle disc uh, that they're working on. And hopefully, they can continue that that cycle of the Sibelius symphonies. Um, if, if he comes back. Uh, Morton Gould, uh, ASCAP announced the, the Morton Gould uh, Young Composer Award winners this past week. We encourage you to check those out. I don't know if there's really anything to say. Yes. Uh, Speaking Sam, of young composers. Say what? Well, uh, I just wanted to note that they have, I mean, the guidelines for the, quote, Young Composers Award, I'm not sure what they are, but they also have uh, a very young composers award, ages 10 to 17, and in that list was a 10-year-old yeah. Um, Shashank Narayanan, which is the same last name as one of the primary developers on Photoshop. <laughs> I know that because every time I open Photoshop, I see that name. <laughs> Possibly. Um, information. Right. It's, it's, it's uh, information for life here on Sound Notion. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> yeah that's right. So I'm going to give her name. I mean, this is, this is for my own edification. We need to move along, but... I want to see if she has a SoundCloud account because I want to hear this music. Is she wrote at ten years old? No, it's, I'm it's sure. A guy, Shashank. I think it's a oh, guy. Okay. Mm. Uh, see, that sounded like a girl's name to my dumb Western ears. I'm sure it's better than any music that I wrote when I was ten. Yeah. Right. Um, which was zero music. Right. We've always complained on this show, as we do about many things, about uh, the lack of useful metadata in streaming services. Spotify and Naxos announced this week that they are they have added the composer's name to the metadata for 40,000 Naxos albums on Spotify, which is great, except they have added it to the artist field. So unless you already know who the composer is when you're looking at the track, you will not be able to recognize uh, which person in that list is the composer. Which is fine if it's like George Friedrich Handel, but less fine if it's a new piece or a composer that you're not familiar with. There's no composer field. They just kind of slapped it into artist. The thing that this does let you do, though, and this is the nice thing, is it lets you search by composer for the people that are on those albums on Spotify. Um, so thank you uh, for your, your work, Spotify and Nexus, but we would like a little bit more. Um, step in the you. right direction. It's a step this in the right direction. Dave's, this is one of Dave's pet peeves, in case you couldn't tell. It's cr- it drives me bananas. Uh, <laughs> Sam, you want to you want to tell us about these ringtones from Spectral Quartet? Um, I'm not sure how long ago this happened, but I remember us covering on the story as an interesting, just quick story to mention that Spectral Quartet, which is a string quartet, had commissioned or was in the process of commissioning a bunch of composers to write ringtones. And I think the guidelines were basically 30 or 40 seconds or something like that, or shorter. Right. And the, the composers that they got is an amazing list, um, including Nico Muley, uh, including uh, Sarah Kirkland Snyder, 
Uh, Augusta Reed Thomas, Bernard Augusta Rands. Augusta Reed Thomas, Bernard Rands, uh, David Lang, and Julian Run. Run. We were listening to these a lot before the show, and there's some really great ones. We encourage you to check them out. They're 50 cents. Across a wide range of genres. The composers. Mm-hmm. They're 50 cents, and you can buy them and have them on your phone. Uh, I don't make my phone make any noise anymore because it is bound to make noise in a time when I don't want noise to be happening. Uh, but for I, we were talking before the show, one thing I might let it make noise for is an alarm to wake me up in the morning, and there's some good, some really interesting sounds. And there are yeah. these nice... Compelling little miniatures. Um, Give us one, Dave. Uh, what do you want to hear? Give us one of them. Well, the David Lang was good. Bernard Rands was good. The best three Thomas was good. All right. Well, let's see. What, here's I, I, the one I just randomly clicked on is uh, Shulamit Ron, I think. Um, oh, man. Spotify or SoundCloud's being weird all of a sudden. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Right, Dave. Cool, right? Yeah, that's what we, as, as we were thinking about before the show. It sounds exactly like the the quartet for the end of time, lick, right? Yeah. You're just waiting for him to start cranking into that groove. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm thinking in my head the whole time. Is it would, Todd, Todd was just kind of grooving out to it. That's exactly what I was doing when I heard that. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's very arresting. It really calls you know, really tells you there's a phone call. There's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or perhaps <laughs> a text you, message you, of some kind, uh, a Facebook post or a tweet. Yeah. Um, if you guys, if you guys go to the site after the show today and get started, you won't be able to stop. They're like potato chips. Yeah. I mean, you, you feel like you've got to listen to every single one of them. And uh-huh. and they're they're so different. There's, there's such diversity there. Like there's that, and then there's um, Dude, Mason Bates. Like, is a Mason Bates, right? Um, I uh, da, 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 where is Mason? Roll da, F. Da, da, da. <laughs> uh, here, how about I just you know find it. Like that. I I know the Sarah Kirkland Snyder one would be really nice to wake up to. So that that doesn't even feel that foreign for the medium, right. um, <laughs> in, a in a good way. Though. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's cool stuff, and and we would encourage you all to check it out and and support cool, interesting projects like that. Um, I mean, I, I don't. This is certainly not going to replace your music listening, but it's it's a nice uh, extra dimension. Or there. Yeah, a nice little nice little snack throughout the day <laughs> on your on your crappy phone speakers, but it's cool content. Um, Thomas Dolby would be proud. Right, I'm sure he. So is. Sam, do you have a, a pick of the week for us? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. We haven't done that for a while. I I, I missed it. Yeah. Uh, our pick of the week this week is from our guest, uh, Todd Tarantino. Todd has shared a, a, this is a live recording, right, Todd? Yeah, it's a live of, recording of of a piece called Traffic. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, do you want to maybe explain a little bit about what we're what we're going to listen to before we take a quick listen to it? Yeah, it's it's big and loud. Um, yeah. You know, it, I've spent uh, my wife's an anthropologist, so I spent a lot of time in India. And uh, one trip I was in Varanasi, which is, uh, the, you know, the holy city on the Ganges. But the traffic in India is just incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you're stuck, you know, on your cycle rickshaw, you're piling into things. And the wonderful thing about it is that, that everyone is doing their own thing in their own little private world. You'll be riding along and there's a guy on the street corner, you know, doing some tap, tap, tapping or whatever. And everyone sort of moves around and... You know, then the cow comes out and no one hits each other. So there's sort of this very complex interplay of people doing heroic things, but no one paying attention. It's kind of like new music. Um, <laughs> so that was something that I wanted to sort of put forth in the piece. It's uh, sort of the energy and the excitement and the, the, the motion of everyone at the same time. Excellent. Uh, well, here, can you tell us who's playing this? This is the Manhattan Sinfonietta. Okay. Uh, under Jeff Malarski. They existed in New York for about four years, 
um, and they don't exist anymore. All right. So uh, without any further ado, this is Todd Tarantino's Traffic. So that was an excerpt from Todd Tarantino's Traffic, performed by the Manhattan Sinfonietta. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that with us, Todd. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so uh, you can really hear what you were saying, all the, the madness of the traffic and the relentlessness of, of, the, of the traffic. And then you can hear the, in, the individual segments of the ensemble that are kind of all going in their, their different directions um and 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 while there's great counterpoint there it it's almost as though the individual musical ideas are 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 ignoring one another and we're weaving in and out of one another but not really caring too much about what the other ones are trying to do either well you know oddly enough each instrument in the group has their own little solo so there's like a little 12 mini concertos you know 20 <laughs> seconds so there's one very poignant moment I, I always remember from the performance of, of the viola player sawing away at some very challenging little part while everyone else is just doing their own thing. And so you see the poor little viola player there and you just feel for them. You know, it gets louder and crazy. They have to do it at the end of the concert because otherwise all the brass people, you know, can't do anything afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to hear it again. Ensemble. Well, I really, the, what we were hearing right near the end of the excerpt was really compelling to me because you're focused very much on local sound, like this sound and that sound and this sound, but then right at the end, you started hearing this big churning thing that was like cycling around. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really cool. I mean, it, it's very perceptible even to you know someone who's not yeah. endeavoring to listen super closely. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah right. you, you can hear the kind of the, the churn of the, the, the big engine of everything moving together that is kind of on top of all those individual little a, weaving parts. It's a big, big barrel of noise that then the barrel starts rolling, too. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> a barrel of noise. That is, that is a, a great way to describe. That's, that's a pull quote for you. Yeah, Put yeah. that on your site. Okay. Yeah. Todd Tarantino, barrel of noise. <laughs> So thank you guys so much for, for sharing your music with us and sharing an hour or so of your time with us this morning. We really appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. Before we go, um, 
I know we've been we've been talking about the the festival all all morning. Anything that you have to plug, take take a minute and and, and tell everybody where they can go to, to learn more about it and, and check out the stuff you're doing. Uh, Let's we'll start with Todd. Um, my own website, toddtarantino.com. You can see scores, hear lots of recordings that you've never heard. Uh, come to the Mata Festival. We'll be performing a new piece of mine called Cap Malaru uh, for soprano and ensemble. And you can stream that too later. Excellent. Can people hear the rest of uh, traffic there on your site? You can indeed. Excellent. We will be sure to link to that. Uh, Yotam, uh, you want you want to I, plug anything, or have you plugged well, everything I, you have to plug? <laughs> I want to encourage everyone to attend as much as they can of the Mata Festival. We really would love to see as many fresh faces as we can. And uh, even though concerts start on the 16th, uh, we invite you to come to the opening night bash on the 14th at the beautiful Paula Cooper Gallery in uh, Chelsea. And uh, we hope to celebrate the entire week with you. So thank you so much for having us on with you today. It was great. And and we'll see you at the festival. Excellent. Uh, so... That is going to do it for this week's Sound Nation. We had a great talk uh, with Yotam and Todd. And if you would like to watch this, if you're watching live, thank you. We do stream this show live uh, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you are just tuning in now and you want to watch the part that you missed, you can watch all, all of our shows at soundnotion.tv slash SN. And you can also find links to the, the festival, to Todd's site, to Yotam's site, to... All of the things that we talked about today, curated by our own Sam Mercier's, and that is also soundnotion.tv slash SN, and you can leave a comment there as well. If you'd like to comment on any of the things that we talked about today, you can do that there. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, we're Sound Notion on Facebook. We're also on YouTube, so subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, follow us on Twitter as well. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDoe. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at a Nate tree. Uh, the Mata Festival is at Mata Festival, and you should definitely uh, follow them and, and keep up to date on all the cool things that they have going on. Not just the festival, but also the the interval series that we talked about, where they're doing things even outside the festival to to make the 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 great to make great things happen year round. Um, so be sure to do those things if. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated, uh, including Stitcher. If you do the Stitcher thing, you can you can find us on Stitcher. Uh, you can support the show by telling your friends about how great our show is and and directing them to our site. You can also search uh, and buy your, your Amazon goodies uh, through the Amazon affiliate search box that we have on the right side of our site. It doesn't cost you anything, but we get a little uh, commission for that, uh, and that helps us out a lot. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lapp. Be sure to tune in next week. We'll be talking to uh, Larry and Arlene Dunn about all the cool projects that they have going on. And we will see you next week.